Thank you, guys. Appreciate you working on Blessed Assurance for us. Last week, they sang Blessed Assurance to a tune, and today they sang Blessed Assurance into another tune. Blessed Assurance was written by Fanny Crosby, and I think the words in Blessed Assurance are important for us to understand. In the third stanza, her words are, Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above. And then she says, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. And then translated down to filled with his goodness, lost in his love. In the Christian life, it's important for us to know what we have and then to know what we do with what we have. And we find that teaching in Hebrews chapter 10, found in verses 19 through verse 25. So if you look there with me, we will see what the scriptures has to say for us today. Since we have, let us. Since we have, let us respond is the message we find here in this scripture. In verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God. Since we have, there are three things here that the writer reveals to us that we have in Jesus. We have access to God through the blood of Jesus. We should have confidence in that access. We have the curtain has been torn for us. So the doorway is open for us to have access to God. And since we have a great high priest, We have personal access to God. We do not need a priest. The way it was will be like this. Now, I I got a seminary education, believe it or not. Uh, I graduated. Uh, I've been licensed to the gospel, and I've been ordained to the gospel. So I'm pedigreed. I got the pedigree. So, the way it was, I'm the closest one here to a priest for you. I'm the high priest. Here's how it works. You bring your offering to me, and I'll take your offering, and I'll take it in before God. You don't see God. You don't enter his presence. You don't have a relationship with God. I have the relationship with God. And your relationship with God is through me. Now, you can't even read the Bible for yourself because I'm the one that's credentialed. I'm the one that's been called. I'm the one that's been chosen. Simply, I'm much better than you are. So I'll read the Bible for you. I'll read the Bible And I'll tell you what to believe about the Bible. Matter of fact, I'm going to require that since I can't trust most of you to understand what the Bible has to say, don't read the Bible unless you're at church with me. So you can leave your Bible here because since you can't understand it, there's no reason for you to take your Bible home with you because you don't have what it takes. You are not credentialed to understand the Bible. Now, that's kind of the way it was. That was the way it was during this day when you had to have a priest. You had to have that credentialed person. You had to have that person from the right tribe. You had to have that person that had the right pedigree to be able to go before God on your behalf. Now, we don't understand that today. Today, we understand that we each have the right to go before God. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us 
that because what Jesus has done for us through the blood of Jesus, we can have confidence in the fact that we ourselves can go before the Lord. We don't need a priest. Matter of fact, he's not better than you. That pastor that you have is not better than you. He understands the Bible the same way that you understand the Bible through the work of the Holy Spirit. And you have the right to question him. You have the right to ask him. You have the right to take the Bible and find out for yourself because we have a great priest and that priest is no longer a man, but that priest is Jesus Christ. And we have that right. Priesthood of the believer. So since we have access to God by the blood of Jesus, and since the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple and really the rest of the world, we have access to the work of Jesus on the cross. The temple was cut in two. In fact, Dennis, when he died on the cross, that temple was huge, hundred and something feet tall, wide, thick material, uh, just elaborately made, really ornate. That temple from the top to the bottom just was torn. Amazing, isn't it? Because now through Jesus, we have access. And we have access and we have the right as individuals to go before God, each one of us, by ourselves. No need of a priest. No real need of a pastor. The pastor is just there, assigned by God, to guide, to lead, to, to, to pastor. Pastor, not pastor. Put him out to pastor, baby. But to pastor people. Since we have this great high priest, all of us have the luxury, the right, the privilege to come before God ourselves. That's what we have. Since we have this wonderful foundation, since we have this wonderful privilege, let us. Last week we left with the idea that we got it good. Ain't we got it good? It's important for us to understand how good we've got it. And when we discover what the Bible has to say about what we have, there's no other, you know, thought that we can have other than we really do have it good. God has made it so wonderful for us. Since we have it good, since we have privilege, since we have the right to be his son, since we have been chosen, since we have been adopted, since we have been blessed by the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy of Almighty God through the blood of Jesus, this is what we need to do. Verse 22, let us draw near. Well, we get to have a personal relationship with God. Before, our relationship with God was based on being a good person and having good works and good morals, but we did not have a personal relationship with God. The practice of man to control, to be the the manipulator of people's faith, took over and, and just completely took it away from the people's ability to have a relationship with God. It's what God wanted, faith. By faith, Moses, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Samson, by faith, but that's the way it was. And now the scripture tells us that through what Jesus has done for us on the cross, we can have a close, personal relationship with Almighty God through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is there to help us do that. So, since we have, let us, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Full assurance, a guarantee. We can have a right relationship with God by faith. It is fully assured to us. We are absolutely guaranteed of this right standing with God through what Jesus has done for us. So, since we have salvation... Since we have right standing with God, since we have complete, absolute, total forgiveness, since we have eternal life, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance and faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We can let go and be completely satisfied with the forgiveness we have through Jesus. We are forgiven. 
There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, to keep this right standing with God, we don't have to do much. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to work. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be what we're not. We just have to be. We just believe, and God credits us as completely righteous. However, because we have received such a wonderful gift from God, we want to be right. We want to do good things. We want to honor Him. We don't need to do it to measure up. We don't do it to make Him notice us. We can't be noticed anymore. We do it just because we're so thankful for what God has done for us. And our good works, our religious activities, our morality, our being a good person... It's just out of gratitude. We get to do that. It's not we're obligated to do it. It's not we have to do it for the right standing. But we choose to do it because the right standing is already in place. There's not anything we do with that. But we get to honor God and to please Him. And we do it because we just want to. We have been forgiven. Our conscience has been cleansed. Our hearts have been sprinkled. They have been cleansed from evil conscience, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. So he says in verse 23, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Oh, since we have this Christ, since we have this foundation, since we have this right standing, Let us hold fast. Let us hold firm. Let us hold strong the confession of our hope without wavering. Let's be faithful. Let's be faithful in our belief. Let's be faithful in our perspective of God. Let's be faithful in our loyalty to Him. We're not going to betray Him. We're not going to betray God. We're not going to commit spiritual adultery because of what He's done for us. We've got it good. We're thankful for what he's done. If we choose to betray him, if we choose to commit spiritual adultery to him, he's not going to get rid of us because he has given us his only son and he's given the promise that no one can take you out of my hand. I'm stronger than yourself. I'm stronger than anyone else. You're in my hand. You have salvation. You have justification. You are forgiven. You are right. You are adopted into my family. You have received the family name. You're not going to lose that. And so we hear that. We understand that. We apply that. And we go, man, that's awesome. I'm going to hold firm. I'm going to hold on to the faith that I have in Christ. I'm going to, I'm going to be loyal to God. I'm going to live for Him every single day for the rest of my life because of what He's done for me. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. Now, I like stirring people up. But I need to be stirring people up for love and good works. That's what we are to do. Now, this is a good worship time. This is the way it ought to be. We come together and we are thankful for what we have. We're reminded for what we have. It's reminded. We're reminded of what we have in Christ. We celebrate what we have in Christ. Then... We discover, we think, we consider how we can repay God through our love and good works. Not for more right standing, because we can't have any more right standing we already have, but so that we can honor Him, glorify Him, we can show the world what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. And the way that we do that is through stirring up one another to love and do good works. Consider, think about, how can you stir up people? Well, I think you can stir up people by your testimony. I think you can stir up people to love and good works by sharing the things the Lord's done. 
sharing his activities, sharing what he's done, sharing the changes that he's making in you. You do love and good works, and you sow that seed in other people that want to sow the seed in good works. Steve did that today. Steve came and said, we have some opportunities for you to demonstrate your love and good works by being involved in these mission opportunities that we have. That's, that's us doing our very best to spur you one another on to good works. I'm trying to spur you on this morning by letting you hear through Hebrews chapter 10 how good we've got it, how blessed you are, how God has just loved you so much that he has really set you up well. He has made it so that you don't lose. We don't lose anything. We win. He has, he has made it possible that we can live every single day, regardless of how difficult it is, in complete understanding that victory is ours. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Man, we got it good in him. So let's show his, his love. Let's do good things to spur people around us to want to serve God with all of their heart, with all of their soul. Bill came today and said, man, I went to the Holy Land, and, and, and it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. I'm here to tell you, one of the greatest discipleship trips you'll ever have to walk where Jesus walked and to see the things that Jesus saw, and this, the Bible comes alive. And I believe personally that people that go have a deeper understanding of the Word, and they see it, and the Gospels come alive, and, and it, something s special just happens. You see, we are doing all we can to foster discipleship, to, to, to guide you, to teach you, to, to uh, uh, spur you on to love God with all of your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's why we're always talking about that. I told the new members group this morning that if you're here for two or three years, and, and you know, you move on to go somewhere else and, and the, your job moves you or whatever happens in this, you know, this transition community that we have, that people come and they're gone and they go and move other places and all those kind of things, is that while you were here, your love for God increased and your love for others increased. That's what we want. We do want you to get knowledge. We do want you to get understanding. We do want you to become more like Christ. We want you to be all kinds of things. But we want you to fall in love with God and love God with all of your heart and all your soul and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I'm working it. I'm trying with all my heart to communicate to you, to spur you one on, to love God with all your heart. And I'm telling you by telling you what the Bible has to say about it, look how good you've got it. Man, you're right with God. You're forgiven. Your, your loved ones are going to be able to celebrate at your funeral because of what Jesus has done for you. They're going to be able to walk away from that cemetery, hopefully sorry that you're gone, but rejoicing that you're with Jesus in heaven. We've got that going for us through belief in Christ, because of what He's done for us. So... Love God with all your heart because of what he's done for us. And, and look around and consider how can you live in such a way that you can spur other people to love God and do good works. How do you do that? Follow the Holy Spirit. Listen to what he has to say. Show an example. Teach the word. Guide. And say, you ought to do this. You ought to do that. We, we should do this. We should do that. You know, if, if we did this, we would show how much God loves us. Man, just get on with it. And he goes on to say here, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together. Believe it or not, the reason why the pastor's always saying, come to church, come to church, come to church, is, is partly for his ego so he can have a good Monday morning, but more importantly is that you will come together and you will be reminded of what you have so you can go out there in this world and you can do the let us's. That's, what, that's all it's about. 
We want you to come to church. We want you to be in a small group. We want you to come and fill this house up and meet together so that we can do what God has assigned us to do. And none of us do well outside of meeting together. And so you can spur each other on to good works and you can spur one another to love other people. We have a better opportunity when God's people are meeting together. And that's what Hebrews says for us to do. Meet together and stir up the brothers and sisters. Meet together and, and share testimony and share prayer and share answers to prayer and share his word and let each other know what we have in Christ and say, let's get on with it. Let's live for it. I know you're going through a hard time. I know it's difficult, but we're in it together. We're brothers and sisters. We're loving each other. We're holding each other up. We're holding to the faith that we have. We're strengthening one another. Man, we are just on each other's side. We're in the ditch with each other. We're loving, hard to love people. We're trying to endure faithfully the mission that God's called us to. Be part of what God's doing. Make yourself available to the Holy Spirit and let Let's put ourselves in a position where God can bless us to the full extent of it. And the only way we can do it is let us meet together. Let us meet together. I came through this morning about 9 o'clock and one of our young families are getting out of their pickup truck. And, and, and the young girl is dressed to go play volleyball. And I said, you have a volleyball game after church? And she said, no, we've already played. We're just now coming to church. I said, what time was your game? She said, oh, early this morning. Let us consider how to spur one another on to, to good works and good deeds. Man, I thought that was so wonderful. What is that mom and dad showing their kids? It's important that no matter what's going on in our lives, no matter how busy we are, worshiping God and being with God's people is absolutely crucial to the mission that we have. That's what we need to do. That's what Hebrews says that we need to do. Let us meet together. Let us gather. Let us assemble. Let us show up and see what God's going to do in our body. It says that some neglect to meet together. Some develop the habit of not meeting together. Let's not be like that. The scripture says, let's get lost in his love, Fanny says. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. All the more. We need to encourage more and more and more as we recognize that time is short for us. And time is short. Time is short for the coming of Christ. Time is short for the change in the judgment of God on our world. But I'm telling you, time is short with the opportunities we have with one another. Let's make the most of every opportunity we have. Every time we get together, let's encourage. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. You can hang in there. You can... You can be a great image bearer of Christ in your world. Build each other up. Strengthen each other. Encourage, encourage. How do you encourage? Well, you encourage by considering who needs it and starting there. Who needs to be encouraged? I encourage you, stay with your wife. I encourage you, stay with your husband. Support them, guide them, lead them. I, I encourage you, hang in there with your children. Don't give up. Fight, fight, fight for their souls. Fight for their life. Fight for their, their understanding of what it means to live for Christ. Encourage your pastor. Encourage your staff. Encourage your leaders at the church. Encourage your Bible teacher. Encourage and encourage them. Write them a note. Give them an email. Give them a text message. Give them a phone call. Encourage them. Encourage them. We need you. We're following. We're on, we're on your team. We're learning from you. You're guiding us. Keep on. Pray for us. Keep on moving forward. Let's be the church. Let's be the church that God wants us to be. Time is running out. Let us follow the words of Fanny Crosby. Filled with His goodness, the sense we have. Lost in His love, the let us's. Since we have, 
let us. Since we have, let us. All glory to God. Amen. Let's pray. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to you in every way possible. Lord, I pray that you will lay it on our heart how we can spur one another on to good works and love and how, Father, as we continue to meet together for the high calling that you call us to, that we will encourage each other to hang in there, to move forward in faith, to trust you, to believe in you, and live for you. Lord, we are so thankful for what you have done for us. We're so thankful that we can confidently come before your throne today, that we have access. We are so thankful that the curtain has been torn, and we're so thankful that we have Jesus, our great high priest. Everything is in place for us to have all the motivation we need to have to love others, to do good things, and to encourage each other, and to keep on meeting together. For your glory, in Jesus we pray. Amen. Ushers, come forward.